The Portfolio Composer, episode 186. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Hope, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now, for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. I have to learn how to create connections on my own and make a portfolio of my own and finding publicity without having ties to a more well-known indie studio. It was sort of a learning opportunity of it's my job to make my own success. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Just released, Dorico Pro 2 is a major new version, including features for musicians working in film and TV music and in jazz, rock, and pop. Steinberg have also released Dorico Elements, a new entry-level application that packs all of the essential power of Dorico Pro into a simple, streamlined package that is ideal for those getting started. Find out more later in the show. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Portfolio Composer. I am your host, your coach, your teacher, Garrett Hope, and I'm excited to spend this time with you. I've been on a journey for a long while now to figure out what it means to be a composer in the 21st century and how I can create a sustainable living writing music. And I'm having, or I have had a lot of really interesting thoughts about this, primarily that I need to treat what I do as a business and that the business of composing is about creating and monetizing assets. And you can find more of my thoughts on this. I've been blogging about that on the PortfolioComposer.com website. But along the journey, I've been really interested in walking alongside composers and helping them figure this out too, and sharing what I know and what my experiences are, and explaining some of these concepts like marketing, because we don't get training in school on how to market promote ourselves, position ourselves in the market, and create businesses. And one of the people that I've been walking alongside for a couple of years now is Tony Manfredonia. And Tony and I have been speaking a lot. We speak a lot regularly, actually. And I wanted to have him on the show to show another composer who is in process, someone who is seeing tremendous amount of success in what he's doing, and he's working really hard at it. But Also someone who's emerging, not yet uh, what we could consider an established composer because some of the interviews on the podcast are with people who have, using air quotes, made it. They are highly successful. They're big names, and it's easy to get overwhelmed by that. So I want to show you someone who's taking action right now to build the career that they want to have. So I'm very excited to introduce all of you to Tony. Tony, welcome to the Portfolio Composer. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, I'm I'm honored to be here. This is a thrill. <laughs> it's kind of fun to have you on the show. I mean, you and I've spoken on the phone a lot, yeah. and we text quite a bit, so it's it's fun to do this. Yeah, well, it's crazy. I've been listening to you to you for since. I mean, since you were a composer on fire. I mean, I was still in I was still in my undergrad, so it's been a while. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm very excited. Thank you. Oh, good. Uh, I want to tell a little bit more about you here. Sure. Tony is a composer living in Petoskey, Michigan. Is that Petoskey or Petoskey? Petoskey, yeah. Petoskey. Tony is a composer living in Petoskey, Michigan, providing a sensory experience through colorful orchestration and warm melodies. Recent performances include ensembles such as the University of Cambridge Concert Band and the Brazos Sports Symphony Orchestra. Composing soundtracks for video games, such as Call of Saragnar and Karen's Crypt, he aims to audibly enhance each game world. Continually advocating mental health awareness, he musically expresses the inexpressible for those who don't have a voice. Tony, I love your bio. I feel like I've seen you develop this story as you figure out how you're going to move forward as a composer. So I would like to start our conversation today by asking kind of you to share your journey compositionally and how you came to focus on video games and mental health awareness advocacy. Sure. Yeah. No, thank you for the, for the question. I, I mean, I appreciate that. So I, I mean, 
I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I went to school there, you know, Temple University for composition. But before I did that, I actually started off at Montclair State for one year, Montclair State University there. In, it's in New Jersey. And there I met someone who uh, writes music for video games still now. And he's part of a studio. They, they make games and stuff. And he was a composition major. And at that time he asked, hey, do you want to like help me write some additional tracks? And I said, sure, what the heck, why not? You know, I've always loved video game music, so I thought it might be fun. Um, and ever since then, I don't work with them anymore, but ever since then, I, you know, have kind of just kept building a portfolio and kept just working on projects, some paid, some not paid, you know, the whole, you know, game jams and little things here in between. But now after graduating and living here in Michigan for a couple of years, I sort of, that's like, a huge chunk of my income. In addition to writing concert music, a lot of which is focusing on mental health awareness. So I just had a solo violin piece premiered by Katie Rindernecht at the University of Iowa, and it was called At the Breaking Point. And it was about sort of intrusive thoughts that people with OCD or anxiety might have, you know, the, just the constant thought kind of tearing you apart inside. So I try to incorporate it more so from things that I've experienced, but also for, you know, if someone is explaining to me, here's a situation with depression or anxiety, I try to incorporate it so that someone who's too afraid of saying it or or doesn't know how to express themselves through words, I can sort of be that voice. You know, it's not all of my concert material. It's not all of my concert works, but I try it as much as I can just because I, I myself have been through it. My wife has been through it and it's some pretty tough stuff out there. So, yeah, I want to ask a few questions about that if I can. Sure. I remember working with you in some of our first conversations about identifying your audience and figuring out how you can serve that audience. And it took you a while to land here on mental health awareness What has that done for you as a creative individual, both just in how you think about what you're doing and as well as boosting your career and getting so specific and trying to serve people by being that voice? That's an awesome question. I think it really stems from, it honestly stems from, that's what I know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to like sound too morbid on here, but like, you know, I went through some, through some tough stuff and you know, out of coming out of that, it's what I sort of had to live and breathe for a while, you know, mental illness and and figuring it out and how do I get better? And, you know, so much stuff that all those thoughts kind of incorporate into my music subconsciously, I think. I mean, even on some of my video game stuff, whether, you know, happy or sad or whatever, there's a certain level of intensity that I don't think would have been there had I not sort of gone through hell and back. And because of that, there was really no other choice for me than to to stick with that because that's what my music tends to speak most is when it's related to some level of, you know, high intensity emotion, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. whether that's love or whether that's depression, whatever it may be, you know, that's what I do best. And I kind of, after identifying that and after trying, well, maybe I can go, you know, the, the full, you know, film media route, or maybe I can do the, you know, the atonal 12 tone stuff. And I tried it out and I still incorporated here and there, but there's some really strong 12 tone composers and, and serial composers, you know, like Joseph Schwatner that like, I would never get on that scale because that's not me, you know, whereas being a mental health advocate, especially since our, my wife and I met on Tumblr for mental health awareness and, and recovery blogs and stuff, like that's what I know. That's what I can do best. Um, and that's the voice I can speak to best, I think. Hmm. I like that kind of writing from experience and writing from a place of understanding. Right. Yeah. I mean, the music comes out of you, you know, you, it's, it's tough to make something that doesn't feel natural to you. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going out of your comfort zone, but when it speaks volumes internally, when it inspires you, you know, your music is going to reflect that the end result is going to reflect that. Yeah, Absolutely. Well said, man. I couldn't have said that any better myself, actually. Hey. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. What are you working on right now that's really got you excited? What's coming down the pipe? There's a couple things. Regarding video game music, I'm working on a couple of projects. One that I just recently started, Karen's Crypt, 
And depending on when this podcast goes live, you know, it may be done. But right now, as we speak, I'm working on Karen's Crypt and it's kind of replicating the Game Boy era, Game Boy Color to be specific. I get to create those sounds, you know, with Cubase and the digital audio workstation. So I got to replicate that Game Boy sound, but I'm still keeping the music complex enough. It's it's kind of a scary, you know, kind of like Legend of Zelda, but it's more so from like a castle dungeon, you know, cobwebs and skulls and bones and stuff. So the music is definitely kind of darker, but I, I'm loving it because it's it's probably the closest thing that I've ever done that's like scoring a Legend of Zelda game, <laughs> basically. <laughs> And I think that's why I'm having such a good time with it. And uh, yeah, the development team, they're from Spain. They're great. So it's its a really cool experience. Wow. So early video game music based on the technology is called 8-bit music, right? Correct. We're talking stuff like very first Nintendo games or, or yeah, like Pong yeah. or something like that. What is this called? It's a little bit further developed. There's greater technology, but it's not like the high risk stuff we do today. No. So it's in a way, it's kind of like mixing like 8-bit and 16-bit so, like, if you were to listen to music from the Super Nintendo, so, like, there's, like, the Nintendo Entertainment System, which was all 8-bit. Then you listen to the Super Nintendo, or SNES, which is 16-bit. This game is kind of like a mix of those two, and so, likewise, the music reflects that. So, there's a lot of, like, the chiptune sounds, but there's also the more, you know, circa 1996 sounds going on as well. It's kind of neat. It's not, like, a carbon copy of that time period. It's more so, like, a modernized... Retro. <laughs> I know it's a paradox, but <laughs> got it. Oh, and then I'm also working on an opera called Ghost Variations. It's a chamber opera, but it'll premiere as of now. I think it's premiering summer 2019, so a whole year away yet. Um, and I'm almost done. I'm almost done. But it's basically about the late years of Robert Schumann and all the you know schizophrenia and illness he went through. But more so, the focus is on Clara, his wife, and how it impacted her, how his mental illness impacted her, and of course, her family and her children. So it's a darker opera, for sure, but it's a very powerful libretto. Uh, Aiden Feldkamp wrote it. Very, very powerful libretto. So I'm really excited about that to help spread some mental health awareness, kind of like my whole bio said. Yeah, it's what you're about. Yeah. What is that like for you as a composer to put yourself forward in two completely different spheres at the same time? It can be tough to juggle. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's less for me, and this could be different for different people, but for me, it's less difficult. To, the difficulty is less in juggling like the creative ideas. Like I feel, I find that refreshing to kind of bounce back and forth between here's some video game stuff and here's some concert stuff and some atonal and some tonal. Like I kind of enjoy going back and forth, but more so the tough part is like scheduling. Okay. I only have so many days a week to, and times a week to write music. How do I set deadlines? How do I negotiate deadlines with these developers and these ensemble directors and librettists and that type of thing? How do I make it so I can do it all while having a day job and be a husband? That for me is the hardest part. And I'm not perfect by any means, but I I would like to give myself a little bit of a pat on the back for not having a nervous breakdown, (laughs) at least not a bad, not not having a bad one yet. (laughs) Okay. So give us some tips and tricks. What's working for you? Well, I would say make sure, for example, You know, if someone says, "Okay, we want to have this piece on a spring concert, but the date's up in the air. See how late you can make the date, you know, see how far back you can push it, because really, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm the kind of person who likes to set deadlines for myself, maybe like two weeks in advance of the actual one. But at the same time, I'm often like right on the cusp of like handing things in just because I kind of have to balance two different composer lives, if you will, uh, two different audiences So the tip is, number one, you know, give yourself more time than you think you need. Like, seriously, give yourself more time than you think you need. Secondly, when you do work, turn everything else off. Put it in another room and just work. Like, do not go online. Don't do anything. Just work. (laughs) Um, Because if you only, let's say you only have three hours a day to compose in the mornings, Those three hours, except for like getting up to get a drink or to use the bathroom, like make those three hours worth it. Mm -hmm. The the time is of the essence when you do this. (laughs) Yeah. 
You know, uh, I think you've read this book too, but Stephen Pressfield's The uh, War of Art. Yeah, you recommended that to me. Yes. On the mornings that I've been having a hard time getting out of bed, this is what I've been saying. It's one of the things Pressfield reiterates over and over in the book is professionals always show up and they always do the work. So then I'm laying in bed. I'm like, man, crap. I wanted to sleep in. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm going to be a professional. I'll get up and I'll keep writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you do. You have to treat the time as almost sacred. Right. Yeah. Wow. My biggest thing is I, and I, I'm, I still struggle with it. I'm not going to lie. I still struggle with it. I have to do my darndest to not look at my email first thing in the morning because then if you look at your email first thing in the morning and let's say someone, let's say this morning's going to be video game composing day, get an email from ensemble director A who says, man, you know, I was thinking about this. Maybe we should do that instead. And then you're all, then you're putting your schedule in someone else's hands. If you check your email first thing in the morning, it'll throw off your day completely. Don't check your email until like lunch or something. Yeah. That's great advice. What have been some of the challenges for you, Tony? Uh, you graduated with your BA when? 2015? 2016, actually. 2016. 2016. Okay, so you've been working post-graduation for two years, mm -hmm. building this career, and I've known you this whole time. What have been some of the challenges to get to where you are and what you see in the way of where you want to be? Some of the challenges... I know for me, at least just geographically, I decided to move here to Northern Michigan because when I was in school, I was a junior in, in college when Maria and I got engaged and she's from Northern Michigan, a little bit south of the Upper Peninsula. And I had a choice. I said, well, I can marry this woman who means the world to me and I can move to Northern Michigan. Or I can argue and fight and potentially try and persuade her to move here to Philadelphia and live in a arts hub and expedite my career and move things faster um, than where I am right now. And so that was challenge number one. And it's still a challenge. It can be tough. I mean, I love it here. Actually, I would never I would never want to move away at all anymore because I love it here. I love the people. I love the environment. It's a very inspiring and relaxed place. But at the same time, it's not a booming arts hub like Boston or New York or Los Angeles, especially with game music um, or Seattle, Philadelphia. It's very rural. You know, I've had local things happen and we can get to that later if you want. But like it's. A lot of my work comes from online. So thanks be to God that there's like Twitter and Facebook and forums, because without that, I would not be at least cultivating the career that I'm sort of doing right now. So a lot of I mean, honestly, a lot of my brunt work, it's not going to little meetups or local conferences. It's spending more time on Twitter, more time just emailing people and reaching out because that's the only way I can network. And so it's tough. I mean, my my. Things would be probably be faster if I was in a big city than where I am here. Oh, I'm sure. Well, there are more performance opportunities. There's more people. There's more networking chances. But you're also a small fish in a giant pond. Exactly. Exactly. I, I mean, I don't feel like I really know the answer, but I do remember walking through this transition with you and you feeling like there was nothing musically in Northern Michigan. And yet that's proven to be false. Correct. How much of that is just finding the stuff that's there and how much of that is creating your own opportunities? I would say, I would say it's a little bit of both. Okay. And I know that that may not be the answer you're looking for, but I'm not looking for anything okay. specific. <laughs> okay. I, I would say it's a little bit of both because when I was first here, I think I was frustrated a little bit and I was, cause I, you know what? I, all I knew was Philadelphia. All I knew was basically something happening every night, whether it was something I liked or not, something was still happening every night. Whereas here it's like, you know, you get your quarterly concert in the, t in town. But the thing is I didn't, I didn't really weigh all the options. So I didn't really go and see, okay, well, what are all the concerts happening? What are all the musicians that are here? Who, what are all the ensembles that are around? Even if they're like two hours away, you know, two hours away in Northern Michigan is like 30 minutes, 30 minutes in Philadelphia, you know, like the distance is it's, it's more widespread. 
So it's, it can be tough traveling, but like, I didn't, I didn't really think about all my options at first when I was expressing that frustration, when I talked to you all that while ago. So that was the first thing I did. I had to see who was around, what ensembles, what orchestras, what musicians. Secondly, creating your own opportunities is huge because the reason I say this is because that when I first I, when I first moved here, I was working as like an iPhone repair technician. Okay, nothing ideal, but something to help pay the bills while Marie and I got established. And it was there that I met a poet who this past December, five, you know, a year and a half later, I met a poet at that job. And I was like, oh, cool, you're a poet. I'm a composer. What What's your poetry like? So instead of just saying, oh, that's cool, you're a poet. That was a, an immediate opportunity. I was like desperate to like find opportunity, make opportunity. <laughs> so like, I was like, oh, cool. You're a poet. Like, can I see your poetry as I, as I like fix your iPhone battery, you know? And it's like, because of that, it led to a premiere performance in Pittsburgh, just because I went out of my way to just talk to a customer at a store and a repair place that I didn't really care about, but you know, you got it. You got to like find, you got to find it. You got to just meet random people. For example, another person who came into the store used to be a bassoon player. You know, he's, he somehow the, his idea of, you know, discussion about him playing the bassoon came up and I said, Oh, that's awesome. Like, I love the bassoon. And he said, Oh, do you? He was like, do you play it? I was like, no, but I write music. And so then from that, he had connections to a local arts community. Have you ever heard of Mackinac Island uh, mm-hmm. or Mackinac city? You know, he he was like best friends with the Mackinac Arts Council and they were having this big Henry David Thoreau celebration. And so they asked me to write a piece because he said he, I sent him I sent him a, a piece of mine that the Pittsburgh Symphony played. And he said, wow, this is awesome. Like we need to we need to do this. We need to do something like this with you. Like I'll be in touch. And it was a whole year later that he said, you know, there's this there's this thing happening on the island this summer. Like, can you write us a piece for concert band? All because I went out of my way to say, hey, yeah, I'm a composer. That's cool. You play bassoon. Like, tell me about that. So a lot of times you can create opportunities from like the people you least expect and the places you least expect, you least expect. So mainly living in a rural area, making opportunities comes down to going outside and just talking to like everybody because everybody knows everybody else in a small town. I kid you not like every. Oh, yeah. I heard about you like two weeks ago in some paper or like. Yeah, this so and so knows so and so. Like everybody knows everybody. So going out and meeting them is huge. Even if they're not musicians, they may know someone who is. What if going out and talking to people makes you immensely uncomfortable? That can be tough. And so in that case, your best bet is to find the local ensembles. I know I've been asked as a as a vocalist, um, I've been asked, oh, do you want to sing with our choir? You know, there's a couple choirs around here, community choirs. And while I would love to. I don't really quite have the time, but if you're a musician at all, whatever instrument it is, if you can't go out and talk to people, maybe you can go out and perform. Maybe you can join an ensemble and then maybe just like in small talk, when you get a little break in a rehearsal, say, hey, you know, like I'm, I'm, I write music. Do you, do you like new music or, just, you know, initiate conversation and somehow get to doesn't have to be with a huge group. Maybe just someone you've been sitting next to for two weeks singing next to them or playing next to them. You know, performing as a musician in a, in a rural setting, too, is is very people respect you for that, because, I mean, a lot of people around here do a lot of manual labor. And because the arts is so like far and few that when you do perform, it's a big deal. And that that will get you traction without even having to go and say hello to someone. Someone will come to you and say, wow, you sounded great or that was really cool what you did. Mm-hmm. So just another thought. Well, I like it. I think it's a good thought. What I enjoy most about this story of yours is that you had the courage, first of all, to go out and have conversations without knowing what was going to happen. It's not like you were at a new music networking event. Right. (laughs) You're just talking to people in the community. Right. And then you find the the opportunities within the community. Right. And even, even then, you know, if let's say you meet musicians... You know, for example, I can't, I, I mean, it hasn't come to fruition just yet as we talk, but someone has a local uh, Saturday, like first Saturday of the month, a concert series, any type of musician, you know, last, last month, someone played like the Native American flute, you know, whatever it is, some type of music. And, you know, from that, the, the, the woman who runs it has become actually quite a good friend. She's a multi-instrumentalist and she loves new music. And it's like, okay, well you play 
horn. I play piano. I know someone else who plays saxophone. Well, like what the heck? Let's make a new music group. Mm. Let's, let's make a new music ensemble just because it's like, I, just played at her concert. And I, then she was like, you know, I really liked that contemporary piece you, piece you played. I love that kind of stuff. Oh, neat. Okay. Let's see what we can do from this then, you know, find people with, with common ground. It may take a while though. It took me two years <laughs> before I even met this person. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it's not quite like pushing a boulder up a hill, but once, once the ball starts rolling, it gets its own momentum, right? Right. It just takes a lot of effort to get that started. Right. Big time. Big time. Yeah. So you had the challenge of living in an isolated rural area. You had the challenge of not having a network in place. You had the challenge of working and writing, writing music for an industry that wasn't anywhere close to you geographically, but you had the internet. Right. I'm interested to know what are some of the other aspects of your portfolio. Because as you know, one of my big ideas here is that we as composers need to build portfolio style right. incomes, right? So we, we get money from composing, we get money from selling scores, we conduct, we teach. What, what all is in your portfolio at this point? And that can include maybe a non-music job at this point. Sure. Oh no. It included a non-music job for a while. Right now, you know, I'm very blessed to be doing all music all the time. Okay. So what I do is, you know, my month, you know, month to month, year to year salary right now is as a church music director. And because I mean, I've been, I've been Catholic my whole life. So like it, my mom is still a music director. She's been a music director before I was even born. So like, it's something that I sort of know and I'm comfortable with and can do. Um, so that's sort of job number. That's like my day job, if you want to call it that. That's my nine to five is being Mr. Music Director for a church. I'm also there. They have a school attached. So I am their grades K through eight uh, general music teacher, which is interesting to say, to say the least. <laughs> it can be fun, um, but it can also be very, very hard. I mean, it's not what I went to school for, so it can be very hard. It's once a week, so it's my sacrifice, I guess. But it's fun. So, of course, I also compose music. Uh, most of the income uh, is from the, the former two, but then composing music is so supplemental. Like, I, I need that income. It's what pays the bills still, uh, both for concerts and for video games. Don't do any film or anything. It's mainly just those two genres. And I also teach privately composition online. I've had a few students over the past uh, year now. I started last year, and it's... It's really cool. And actually, that's that's a really great learning experience for me. I feel like it, every time I teach something about like augmented six chords, I see something new. Um, so <laughs> that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, right. No, that's good. I feel like I feel like teaching privately has taught me so much at the same time. It's crazy. But so that's that's sort of like my portfolio generally. And of course, I'll substitute. I'll maybe I'll sub for someone by playing the piano or organ at church if they need you know, a funeral or a wedding played or I'll, I'll canter a wedding or something. That's not as common anymore now that I have the full-time church music director position, but it happens every now and then. And it, it helps, it helps out. No, I'm sure. How do you balance it all, Tony? I mean, that's a lot. What, what have you been doing that's working for you? Getting up early. Okay. I've always been, you know, fortunately I've always been sort of an early to bed, early to rise guy. But having a concrete schedule and a concrete time to compose, concrete time where I know I'm going to go into the church to like, you know, print out music and, and get my, you know, practice and stuff, you know, having a set schedule week to week with flexibility, of course, you know, if you're if your tire blows out, you know, you got to, you, of course, my, my wife was the one who told me this one, you can't like freak out that much um, because I mean, that's just life. You know, things happen. So you need to have some wiggle room. You know, if you stay up late or something, you know, maybe get up an hour early, hour later if, if needed, you know, to, to actually have a sound mind and, and ears for the workday. But mainly for me, it's getting up early and having a set schedule. Without that, I would not be able to do it all. Mm. Yeah, that works for me, too. Yeah. A few months ago, I published an episode because I had been bothered by people talking 
about working hard and neglecting other areas of their life or a few other things. And so I created a, a resource, which I'll link to in the show notes for this episode. But I also created a, a podcast where I talked about having a good balance across all the areas of our life, creativity, work, finances, health, right? Sleeping and exercising and what you eat are important. Mm-hmm. Uh, the spiritual aspect, all of that. And you reached out to me. I think that meant something for you. Yes. What was it? Because I don't think you're alone. Yeah. But why was that particular thing useful? And I'm not just trying to toot my own horn here. I'm just trying, I'm trying to point out to people the importance of this balance issue and that they can find a way through it. Yeah. The reason why I reached out is because I think, you know, for me, it spoke to me that when you emphasize faith and family, you know, we, like you said, we live in a world where it's like, here are the top 10 productivity tips, you know, Buzzfeed articles and this and that about working and, you know, business, you know, pure, pure business, non-family faith, anything tips. Okay. Nothing wrong with that inherently. But if that becomes your life, if you, if your life becomes, how do I create the best work all the time? How do I optimize my life specifically for my career? You're going to be missing out on all the things that makes life, in my opinion, that makes life worth it. And so when you said, you know, the importance of family and spirituality, that to me was somewhere I lacked when I first moved here. You know, I prioritized trying to ballpark my career so much because I was, you know, like I mentioned to you, that fear of, well, I'm moving, to, I just moved to a rural area. It's going to take me forever. It's going to take me forever to make a career as a composer. But because of that fear, I worked myself into oblivion, you know, day in, day out, nine to five, did not spend as much time just talking and, and speaking. And just relaxing with my wife. And, you know, now we we pray together. I mean, that's that's a huge that's a huge core of our marriage as our agreement in our in faith. And there was not enough of that. There was not enough of that. And it hurt her. And consequently, it hurt me. You know, I tried. So I was just trying so hard to to make my career happen as a full time composer so fast. And, you know, it wasn't until a little bit that I was like, OK, like, I got to figure this out. And so by prioritizing time with my wife, you know, in prayer together, or even just, I mean, honestly, even just relaxing together. When we first got married, I was just like, yeah, what are we going to do tonight? Let's do something. Let's <laughs> do all these activities. It's like, she's like, why can't we just sit together? Why can't we just sit, you know, yeah. TV off, phones off, just sit and look at each other and talk when we want to talk, you know? And by doing that, by, by making that a part of, our, of my life and, and act, in our life, My creativity has gotten better. My relaxation ability has gotten better. My sleep has gotten better. I mean, I've been struggling for sleep for for years. I mean, I'm still not perfect with sleep, but like my insomnia got a little bit better just because we were able to, because I wasn't thinking about work all the time, because I wasn't thinking about every single second of my life as a networking opportunity or a business opportunity, but actually just kind of put that aside at six o'clock or five o'clock and to just Okay, now now it's my job as a husband because that's a job too. Being having a vocation as a spouse is a, is a job. I mean, it really is. It's an enjoyable one sometimes, most of the time. Sometimes it can be hard, but I didn't prioritize that enough. And when I actually worked less and focused less on optimizing my career life, everything started to fit more into place. Things started to happen better, probably because I was in more of a sound mind of heart and body. That things could happen more naturally. And I wasn't feeling like I was pressed for time. You know, I'm 25 years old. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. And I was very (laughs) impatient with it all. Very impatient with it all. Yeah. I mean, when, when my wife and I were your age as well, before we had our daughter, I mean, we would just take walks. We'd, that's the best part of having a dog. It's like, okay, well, we're just going to go walk for the next 45 minutes. (laughs) and, And you have to be intentional about it. And I hope people don't hear either of us saying that you have to be married, but we all have valuable, important relationships in our lives. And that can look a number of ways, but you have to invest in those relationships. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing is 
it's my personal opinion and you know, and I, I, I really hope that no one is in a place, truly, I really hope no one is in a place from listening to this that they feel like they don't have someone because I'm sure they do. And they may, I, regardless, the thing is when you're working, when you're making all this music, when you're, when you're, when you're creating all this art, it's like, if you don't have that special person or those special people near you to experience it with, it's like, really like what, what's the what's the point? And I don't want that to sound harsh or, or brash, but like, like what's the point in making all of this? If you don't have someone close or someone's a family, friends, uh, colleagues to share it with so that your life isn't just all about work mm-hmm. that you're actually creating and cultivating relationships on a personal level. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. So very, very true. Yeah. What has been one of the most surprising lessons you've learned on this journey, Tony, of building your career? Yeah. You know, I, when I, I was looking at your, your questions and I said one learning opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. And I think this can be relevant. I, at one point in my life, you know, just actually just three years ago, just three years ago, I had to determine that I can't always lean on others for compositional or, or, or career success. And I say that because, and again, I'm not going to mention for the sake of privacy, I'm not going to mention the studio name or, or the whole situation that happened, but my very first like game audio job, if you will, uh, I was a freshman in college, like I mentioned before, and that I was sort of working with that studio for a couple of years. And um, long story short, we ended up not working together anymore. And it was, it was a tough situation. And since then, you know, I, I still follow them. I support them and, and we talk in passing. Um, but it was a tough situation because I considered them close friends too at that time. And, you know, I had, I, it was at that point that I realized I was leaning on them for like a job after I graduated so much. I was like, well, I'm part of the studio. Like once I graduate in two years, like I'm going to keep working with them and I'm going to be great. It's going to be great. I'm going to have a video game composing job and But because that fell through, the lesson I learned was like I as an individual, as an individual composer, need to hone my skills and learn the tricks of the trade. I can't rely entirely on someone else's managing success to be able to do it. Like I have to learn that. I have to learn how to you know, create connections on my own and make a portfolio of my own and finding publicity without having ties to a more well-known indie studio. Like it was, it was sort of a learning opportunity of it's my job to make my own success. If that makes sense. I can't lean on someone for the rest of my life. Right. I'm just writing that down because it's so well said. (laughs) So you said here, and, and I'm trying to use your words, you need to hone your skills and learn the tricks of the trade. And then you elaborated on that and you hit on networking and other things. But does this mean learning how to build your business? Is that kind of what you're referring to? Well, actually, I was more so referring to like, at least for video game composition, like the like ah. audio production, like equalizing and expression, like that kind of stuff. Whereas when I was working with them, it was like, well, here, I'll send you the MIDI file. Then the audio producer would just make the, make it sound nice. Essentially. I technically wrote the sheet music in the MIDI file, but he would do the rest. So like that kind of stuff I had to learn, but you're also right. Yeah. Business managing and and all that. I mean, that's something that I'm still, still trying to figure out, uh, like a good system, you know, it's, it's definitely a lifelong process to figure out a good system. Sure. I bet. So this is awkward for me to ask Tony, because I don't like to just inflate my ego a little bit, though it always feels good. (laughs) How has the podcast and you also did the marketing for composers course and some coaching with Mm -hmm. me. What, what has that done for you? How, how has that been able to help you build your career? I mean, there's, there's so much I could say about that, Okay, but I could, I'm going to try and keep it concise. (laughs) <laughs> just because, I mean, really, you you cover so much stuff that like every little thing, you know, kind of like every little thing contributes, you know. So, but overall, I mean, if I were to if I were to summarize, your coaching and even your course, I mean, mainly both of them in in conjunction to each other, like the advice you give is very uh, 
how do I say this? It, you can easily put it to action. Okay. What I'm trying to say is the things you would suggest to me, I could very easily do and the next day and do it. For example, I know that along the line, you said to volunteer for an orchestra. Literally, we got off the phone and I emailed the coordinator of a local orchestra and I said, hey, I just moved to Michigan. How can I volunteer? You know, it was something I never would have thought of, to be honest. And some people may, may have thought of that. Yeah, go volunteer, like do that. I, I want to do that. But I never thought of that. I never thought of that as one way to sort of build connections. I always thought of that as, oh, they're volunteering. Like they're they're just volunteering for a free concert, you know, essentially. But like, no, like you can volunteer to actually get to know the ensemble. And I never would have thought of that had you not spoken to me and had I not taken your course. So really, it's just I mean, and that's just one example. And I could list it a, t- a dozen. But like your advice is very, very easy to just go and do. I mean, it takes work to figure out what you should do, but once you do, well, with your coaching, you can just go and put it into action. There's no, there's not a lot of waiting with your stuff. There's not a lot of, well, you know, you know, in three months from now, you know, hmm. do this. It's more so what can you like tomorrow? Right. What can you go do? Well, I want it to be actionable. I want you to be able to take steps right now today. Right. Do something to build your career. It's about taking action. Right. And what's cool, though, is that those little steps, the steps you told me to go do like two years ago, only one of them. And I I can't say what just for certain NDA purposes, but I'm meeting with this person for lunch tomorrow who was the volunteer coordinator at one of the orchestras. And we have this huge idea in mind that would not have happened had I not initially went and volunteered at that orchestra. And so who knows where this will go? But it's because of the step you you got me to take two years ago that something now, something big could potentially be coming through. Well, you're the one who took the action, Tony, not me. <laughs> you're the one who told me to do it. So, <laughs> Well, I just I, I really it, that that makes me smile from ear to ear. I'm so happy for you. Like it fills me up to see you have this success. And I'm so honored and grateful that I get to be Thank a you. part of your journey. I really am. Thank you. Yeah, seriously, you're <laughs> a, you're a lifesaver. When you live in when you live in the countryside, you're a lifesaver. Oh, it's great. Welcome. So thank you. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about today that I forgot to bring up or I failed to ask? Well, Let's do I it. Three I didn't tips. ask that, did I? <laughs> okay. All right. What are your three business tips, Tony? My three business tips. <laughs> thank you for asking, Garrett. Um, <laughs> uh, my three business tips. There's someone I know who listens and they're still in college. And he messaged me a couple months ago and he said, yeah, I love the portfolio composer too. So this one is mainly for college students. If you're listening, network and try to find work early and not, that's not just because that's what I did, but I think it's partly because I, what I did. And I think it's a good, it's, it, it can be so helpful. Like even if you're just 18 years old and just starting out as a freshman in college, like the earlier you can start trying to create opportunities and try to avoid calling yourself a student or aspiring composer. Yes. The more work you'll find sooner. That's what I discovered in my career. This also piggybacks on what you said earlier, where you were talking about having to take control of your career and opportunities. No, no one's going to open doors for you. Right. You have to find the work early. Right. So before Marie and I got married, I, the summer before my senior year, I stayed out here with her family for three months. And my summer job that year was writing music for a video game that isn't released yet, but it should vent. I mean, eventually I, I just spoke with him a couple weeks ago, but either way, like that happened because I went out and I was just emailing developers like relentlessly. Like, I mean, I just found games I th- look, think looked cool and I was still in college. And I was like, yeah, I'm this composer. Like, I'd love to make your music for X, Y, and Z reasons. And just basically, I mean, honestly, I was cold calling at that point, but at the same time I was doing it, I was doing it in other classes. Like I was, <laughs> I was so adamant about finding a job before I like finished college that I just was emailing developers nonstop, like crazy. But you know, it's, you don't have to just be a student. You can be a composer. You can be an active working composer as a student. Okay. So that'll be business tip number one. Number two, I would say make social media about everyone else. Even if you're promoting something of your own, make it appear grateful to everyone else involved. 
Like selflessness and gratitude go a very long way. So instead of saying, check out this thing I wrote, say, thank you to this ensemble for premiering my piece. It was a great time to work with you. Or let's say someone arranges a piece of music of yours or something, you know, make it make it about everyone else. Even if it's something you're promoting of your own music, make it about them. Hands down. Selflessness goes a very long way. Yes, it does. Number three, and people might not like this one, but (laughs) stop working so much. Like I, I know that a business tip, stop working so much. Spend more time with other people. Like I said before, being relaxed, you know, and connected with others will literally, it'll fuel your creativity. Yes. It'll give you more energy. But then at the same time, when you do go to work, yeah. like make it intense. Like that's, that's something I advocate for. Like make it, make it intense work. You know, I, I think of even like the piano students when I was in college who would be in a practice room for eight hours. But then like sometimes I'd see them on their phone and, you know, just kind of like walking around. It's like, well, what difference would it be like if they did that for eight hours or just for like two hours, just like went hard to the wire and then just like spend the rest of the day just kind of chilling out and relaxing with people. You know, everybody has their different ways, but I think like shorter intense sessions frees up more time to be able to spend with other people and then you can make more connections that way. So don't work as much, but work hard when you do. I think it also leads to uh, an increased happiness in general, right? A better peace of mind in your entire life, which further frees you to be more creative when you need to be. Right. Yes. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Agreed. All right. So those are my I three. I love it, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you prepped those. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we take a break right here and then we'll come back for the lightning round. That sounds great. How does this feel? Between you and me, and you can broadcast this if you want. This is like a dream oh, come true. Oh, Tony. You give me too much credit. <laughs> but it's true, though. Oh, my goodness. I've been listening to you, like, weekly for years now. And, like, I think of, like, even just meeting up with Jeffrey Beagle and how that – now that I'm, like, working on all these games, like, he and I already talked about, like – we, we originally had this idea of, like, doing – arrangements like piano concerto of like no like the super mario and trying to get licensing but he was like and i said you know what like i'm working on all these games now when they come out you know two three of which will come out by 2019 there's a piano concerto in 2020 right there and he's like that sounds awesome all because i listen to your podcast it's crazy well you have no idea what you have no idea what this podcast does for everybody and i want i want to Make sure that gets on them. I want to make sure I say that on the air because people deserve to know that you are like <laughs> worth it. <laughs> well, now you're just embarrassing me. <laughs> <laughs> My name is George Dimitrov, and I am a composer and an educator, a professor at uh, in Montreal at Concordia University. I started using Doracle right away because I had followed Daniel Spreadbury's blog for a while and I was expecting uh, eagerly the software. I'm incredibly happy. I find it way more intuitive, easy, and fun. I think I work faster, kind of, a little bit faster, but especially with a lot more quality as a, as a result. And in particular, in composition, I'm able to do certain things that I just couldn't have done ever. I really like their no compromise approach to developing features. I mean, they're they're never accepting to do any hack or shortcut. So a feature is either isn't there, or if it's there, it's really well thought out and done. And I think that in the end, it's something that pays us. It's a software that you just enjoy using because the things that are there are really smart and intelligent and well done. But in terms of feature, I think what I like most is the time signatures. In- in Dorico, the music, uh, the, the information about the music is separate from the information about display, how, how it is displayed, which means that you can on the fly change from any time signature to any other time signature, and it will automatically rebar rewrite your entire music just with a single click. And it just works, and all the ties and the rhythm notation is just perfect. And it allows to do all kinds of really complex time signatures for me as a contemporary composer, uh, irregular, additive, irrational time signatures, or even the ability to write without any time signature at all. I feel that things are more intuitive 
it's more logically organized. I feel that I'm working more conceptually with with the music. The way everything is really conceptual, that's what makes the program smart. From the user perspective, it, it makes things more logical, uh, I feel. And in general, I mean, I feel I'm working faster with better results. I feel that really Doric is the future, the way that they are developing it in about a year or two, it will be way ahead of the competition. So um, I really do recommend it. Welcome to the Lightning Round. All right, Tony. Yes? You're not much past 20. (laughs) (laughs) But if you could turn back the clock, think of undergraduate Tony, who's new at everything. What advice would you give to that young man? Take more time. Well, that's one in and of itself, take more time. But take more time to make friends within the music community. I did, I, while I had some great friends in college, they were all fantastic. I was a little uneasy when it came to socializing and that was sort of like the dark times for me. But I really wish, and there's nothing I can do about it now, but I really wish I took more time to just like get to know other like instrumentalists and vocalists, people who would be, you know, the big wigs when they, when they get out of college and keep performing people who would remember me and say, Hey, like, I remember you, can you write me something? Like I didn't make enough of those connections. And so that's one thing I would even just tell everybody who's 20, you know, take time to meet these musicians because they're going to be the ones who will want to play new music and you'll be the ones to write it. Yeah. What is a personal habit of yours that you feel leads to your success? Working quickly and efficiently at the same time. I've always had some ability and I don't know if any, maybe there's someone else who can do this too. I'm not trying to say I'm special or anything, but I, I like, for example, like when I, I work usually between like three and five hour composing sessions, usually like six to 11 or five to, you know, 10 or whatever. But usually like in that time frame, I'm, I'm able to write about, depending on the instrumentation, of course, like two to three minutes worth of music, sometimes four, depend again, if it's like solo piano, I can usually just crank out like depending on the tempo, you know, everything, but usually like piano, solo piano, let's say on Dante, probably about like 3.5 minutes worth of music, no editing, just music on a page, you know, in a single session. I don't know if that came from just like the commercial composing with video games, but just the ability to just intensely write for a somewhat decent amount of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, It saved me from a lot of bad things. Yeah. It's a great skill to cultivate. I don't know if you listened to the interview I did with Aldo Schlaku, who's a Hollywood composer. Yeah. But he said, it's almost normal now to expect in media, the, have the ability to have seven minutes of finished music every day. This isn't music you've just drafted out. This is music that's been polished, refined, edited, and ready to drop into a film. Right. Seven minutes. That's a lot of music. That's a lot of music. Don't even get me started if it's like BPM 126. <laughs> like, wow, I would need a lot of coffee for that yep. one. Yeah, I think... Uh, I always kind of chuckle when I'm working with uh, very young composers and they have these really long pieces and it's like, well, you're writing an adagio. So, you know, there's not a lot of notes. It's really hard to write a long, sustained, fast piece. It is. Oh, it's, I don't know how (laughs) someone like the composers from the romantic era, I don't know how they did it. Everything of like Mozart, you know, his stuff isn't like super fast. But like even I mean, he was he was like, a, you know, he would just crank them out. And at that speed, at that time when there wasn't anything like, you know, atonality, when they were just diatonic, he was I mean, he was a genius regardless. But I, I'm amazed at how fast and how quickly he would be able to write that stuff. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. And that's a guy who has a lot of notes, too. It's not like not like whole notes on every measure. Right. right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, remind me of your instruments. I want to say saxophone. Am I right? Ah, uh, no. I'm totally you're, you're, wrong. Well, no, you're you're right to some okay. extent. That's not like that's not like the instrument. My my trained instrument is voice. I'm a baritone as I get older leaning towards a bass. But I do play saxophone, a little bit. A little bit of saxophone and piano, and then when I got this church director position, I had to pick up organ, which has been a fun fun thing to play. I can't even imagine trying to play with my feet at that point. It's just I haven't, yeah, I haven't, I haven't gotten that down yet. I'm working on it so hard. Well, more power to you. 
<laughs> it's hard. So yeah. what is an instrument you have always wanted to learn to play and why? Oh, the bassoon. <laughs> I've been waiting to say this for three years. <laughs> and I think you might be the only person <laughs> at this point. The bassoon. Why? Yes, the bassoon. Like, well, there's just so much character. I think of like, I mean, Stravinsky. In my opinion, Stravinsky had such great bassoon lines. But like, I think there's just, you know, it can be jovial. It can be kind of creepy. It can be like eerie towards the top range. And it can just be like, I mean, think of the contrabassoon. It can be flat out powerful at the, you know, at the low register. Like, there's just so much variety. I always thought of the bassoon as like the woodwind version of the cello, mm. just because there's just such a wide array of, of expression in the bassoon, in my opinion. You know, Grant Kirkhope, he's a video game composer. His bassoon lines just like crack me up. But then Stravinsky like has this like just like this awesome like melancholy type stuff. And it's I don't know. I could geek out about the second or third piece I like ever wrote was a bassoon concerto. I kid you not, just because I've always loved it. It was I mean, it's terrible. I would never (laughs) want to show that to anybody because it's so bad. (laughs) But we've all got our bad pieces. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What is one composition that has had a profound impact on you and why? I like I like have two. I'll, I'm going to try and keep it to one and maybe incorporate give me, it into the give answer. Me two. But, give me two. OK, so they're both from they're both from video games. And so there's a composer who I'm sure you've heard of the Final Fantasy yes. series. Nobuo Uematsu, he scored mo- like all the games up until about Final Fantasy 10. And now they're like at Final Fantasy 15 and they have different composers and stuff. But I have always loved his music. And there was one Final Fantasy X. I was probably 12 years old. And prior to that, I've always loved game music and I always liked his stuff. But at the end, the ending scene, and just in case someone wants to play the game and they haven't played it yet, I won't spoil it. But at the end of the game, he takes this, there's the song is called To Xanarkand, you know, two different words, To Xanarkand. And normally when you heard it throughout the game, it was this piano, you know, just piano, solo piano, basically. But at the end, he fully orchestrates it. And like, just the, the te- what was happening between the two main characters was like heartbreaking. And in my, like my 12 year old self, I was like weeping at the end of this game. Because of this music, this music is unbelievably gorgeous, unbelievably evocative. And it was at that point where I was like, I mean, I would listen to it for like weeks on end, just like on the loop. I was like, this song is incredible. And I didn't, I mean, I didn't know I wanted to write music, but I knew that like music was powerful enough to move me. And it was really then that I, I like really, truly, truly fell in love with like video game soundtracks and just listen to them nonstop. So that was a more so profound on a level of like orchestration and holy cow, music can really make an experience. So, I mean, if you took the music out of that scene, it would fall flat because the voice acting was like terrible, but, <laughs> but like the story in conjunction with the music just was like, it just blew my mind. I, it blew my, it still wow. blows my mind. I listened to it this morning. I was like, maybe I should think about this piece for the thing he asks. And I, I cried again. I was like, man, this piece is not, this is, this is it for 12 years now. It's like killed my heart. It's done that. Another one though, cause I was torn because the other one, same composer from final fantasy six, there was an opera sequence in the game. And, and, you know, this was, this was in 1990, I want to say 1997, maybe 1995. So the music, I mean, it was an opera scene in the game, but the music was 16 bit sounds and there was no words. But what they did was they've been they've been touring the Final Fantasy music they've been touring now. So the distance distant worlds tour. And there was this piece called Maria and Draco or Draco, however you want to say it. And they basically turned the 16 bit opera into like an 12 minute piece, like full, you know, on stage. And when I listen to this piece, Maria and Draco, there's this there's this line they sing where they say at the very end where they he you know, they're singing in harmony like Maria, Maria, I love you so and the first time I heard this live recording was the September after I basically my final year at college where I was already engaged and I just spent three months with my wife in Michigan. I had to go back and finish school and a tough time in my life uh, emotionally and, and, and mentally. 
And so I heard the song, I was on a run, heard this piece for the first time on a run. And here, of course, they just start singing about this arbitrary woman named Maria. And it is very like, you know, they just, there's this big duel in this piece and stuff and, you know, very operatic. And it was like this, this longing for this person named Maria. And I was listening to this on a run. I was like weeping. I was like, here I am. Like, I have to go a whole other like nine months before I see you again, like, and get married. It was bad. So it was profound impact in a sense that like video game music can take from 16 bit and turn into this fully orchestrated live stage performance. And it is just amazing. The transfer between little electronic bleeps and boops to this masterpiece on a stage, especially for something I'm, it just, I mean, it hit me hard just from the name alone, but I, it just, video game music just blows my mind. So those are the two big pieces that make me cry every time. <laughs> I love it. Long winded story. Sorry about that. <laughs> In another conversation, I'll ask you how you feel about Elliot Goldenthal's score to the final fantasy movie, but don't answer that I now. Wait, you're probably not going to be happy. <laughs> Uh, can you recommend a female or minority composer that you feel we should all get to listen to and know? Yes. Julia Kent. You ever heard of her? I have not. Oh, wow. You got to look her up. She is a cellist and she has a band camp. I mean, her music is easily, you can easily access it on iTunes, Bandcamp, whichever. But she does these, she basically records with herself. She makes these unbelievably evocative pieces just with cello you know and sometimes there's some electronic noises and percussion in there but for the most part it's like a hundred percent cello all layered all with effects but i kid you not like i don't know i don't know what's happened in her life i don't know her story but the pieces just ring just there is so much emotion in there mm. there's this piece she had called called nina and oscar you know, kind of set up like it'd be like a relationship. And, you know, for my entire life, I've tried to might write music that reflects love with these big orchestral things. She did it with a solo cello and like nailed it. Like what love should sound like. I was like, how does she do this? All right. I'll listen to it today. Do it. All right, Tony, book recommendation. What, what do you think we should all read? Rimsky Korsakov's Study of Orchestration. Read it and then read it again and then read it some more. I personally think that's the best orchestration book I've ever read. Truly. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. I've got it on my shelf. <laughs> I read it. Yeah. It is a good I, one. And I, I don't add it. Annotate things normally. That's the one book where there's like highlighted things. And actually I just started rereading it again. I, I make it like an annual and I have like an anniversary with that book every year. Wow. Yeah. I love it. I, I cause I think it doesn't, it doesn't go too much in the instruments themselves. It goes more in, ter in terms of like, how do you actually put it on a page, which I love. Yeah, that is very useful yeah. for that. All right. Where can people find you on the internet and how can they get a hold of you? Yeah. So my website is manfredoniamusic.com. And there you can find links to my uh, SoundCloud and my Twitter and my YouTube and my tutorial series and all those different things. And so to my Twitter just look up Tony Manfredonia because it's too hard to pronounce my handle right now. I'll spell it. It's A M A N F R zero one. It's going to sound terrible when I say this, but like a Manfro with a zero and then a one. <laughs> That's why I like want to change it so bad. But because everybody knows it now, it's like, I can't, <laughs> but it was like, I don't even know how I came up with that. But back when I was called Anthony, I guess, uh, but so, yeah, just look me up any. I mean, honestly, Tony Manfredonia should. There's not a lot of me out there. You'll find me on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I don't have like an artist page, but feel free to find my personal page and message me or whatever. I'm, I'm OK with that. But Manfredonia Music dot com. That's the central hub. Awesome. Tony, as we wrap this up, do you have any final thoughts, words of advice or wisdom? Yeah, just stop feeling guilty for not working all the time, you know? We live in a culture that's very work centric, very career driven, very, you know, don't don't do X, Y and Z until you have X, A, B, C job, you know, like, you know, live, live your life and enjoy the people you're with, you know, stop, just stop feeling guilty for not working all the time. You know, if you're married, that's also a job. It's a vocation. It takes work. You know, and if you burn yourself out from working all the time, creatively or businessy all the time. Your work as a husband or friend or or relative or cousin, well, that'll suffer. So don't try not to get get to that point. 
you know, just relax a little bit. <laughs> it's okay. Yep. I, I love it. Great advice. Tony, I said it before, but I really do mean it. I'm so honored to have had the chance to get to know you and to be a part of your journey. And I'm really happy that we got a, the opportunity to speak for the Portfolio Composer. I'm happy to share your story. And I'm glad I got to pick your brain a little bit some more on how you're thinking about these things and building your career. Thank you, Garrett. I mean, for this interview specifically, but also for the podcast, uh, it's an immense immense asset to so many composers, if not all composers. So thank you. You're welcome. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. The brand new Dorico Pro 2 introduces best-in-class support for composing to picture. Using the same powerful new video engine found in Cubase and Nuendo, attach a video to your project, play it back via the dedicated video window, and see thumbnails in play mode. Add markers at crucial points in the action and display them in the score. Use the new tempo automation controls in play mode to line markers up with beats or find a tempo for the whole cue. New tools in play mode allow you to edit the tempo and dynamics of your music graphically, applying default curves to provide more nuance to gradual tempo and dynamic changes. Add lanes for MIDI controllers and draw data to bring your music to life. With Dorico 2's new automation tools, you can add realism and nuance to the virtual performance of your music, taking it one step closer to the stage or concert hall without leaving your music notation software. And that's only the beginning. Check out the brand new Dorico website at dorico.com slash tpc to find out more.